So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race, and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number 48. Hey, everybody. It's Ed Matthews with the Real Estate Underground. Today is actually a really cool show. Thank you for joining us today. With me is Irfan Raza of Raza Homes. He is based in the Philadelphia area, and we were just talking about how we actually share a love for Temple University. For those of you who know me out there, I also have a love for Villanova, so you know, don't worry about that. But Irfan, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ed. I really appreciate being here. I'm an open book, so excited to to hear what you have to say and excited to answer these questions. Yeah, ooh, don't tempt me. <laughs> so we're going to first talk about why Temple football. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> you and I have gotten to know each other through our mutual friend, Greg Andrade. You know, I'm curious about, and I'm sure our audience is curious about who Raza Holmes is, who you are, and, and what you folks do for a living. So why don't we start with what Raza Holmes does for a living? Yeah, so our primary focus has been for the last 10, 11 years to buy single family, small multifamily residential real estate. And basically we use the Burr method, which means buy, rehab, rent out, refinance. And in order to do that, what we found is there's a product or there has been a product in Philadelphia where you could buy a vacant distressed product, rehab that product, rent it out, and then refinance it. So that's been our main goal, main mission for a long time. And uh, in order to get that goal going, right? I had a goal of 10 units when I initially started, 30 right. by 30, and then 100 units by 35 years old, right? So in order to progress and buy more units and get more unit count, I also had to start a marketing company, right. a direct marketing company, which as a byproduct, wholesales properties. So okay. it's a wholesale company. Primary focus was for acquisition of Raza Homes. And then secondary focus is to make a little bit of money through wholesale properties as well. Okay, so, fantastic. So yeah, that's been our primary focus is, is rental real estate. And then number two focus is the direct marketing. More recently has shifted over more to profit-based, which means that it was, it's been more wholesaling and less acquiring for rentals. Okay. So I want to get into that. In terms of a background though, you know, one of the things that I pride myself on and I, and I suspect you are a similar personality type is uh, being a numbers person. You're a CPA by training, right? Yes, I am. I graduated from Temple, passed my CPA license as soon as possible, got the certificate as soon as I could. And then I remained in the career for about eight years. Yep. Uh, it actually was a successful career too. So I became manager at a regional CPA firm. And I, honestly, I like what I did. I'm somewhat of a numbers person. I like the help that I was given small businesses and larger businesses. And I like seeing the, the number side of business where I could learn the ins and out of businesses. Right. So yeah, that's where passion came to. Yeah. And it, one of the things, so, you know, former consultant on my end and sales and marketing guy, but in the technology world. And, you know, one of the things that I realized pretty early on in my career is that the lessons I learned about process around numbers, around cash management, around marketing and how companies operated were eventually directly applicable to the things that I do in my own business today. Right. And yeah. I'm sure that's the same for you. Yeah, I, I got a great deal of training in the corporate environment. And it's even less than that, just writing an email, right? Like, right. I can't tell you how many times that I've had to politely request somebody to reply all to an email, right? Like, <laughs> that's something you learn right away in uh, corporate America. So, but yeah, from as little as that to learning the ins and outs of businesses, right? Like, you learn a great deal by reviewing books. Absolutely. Books and records, so. Yep, absolutely. And so being a natural business person and someone who's gone to business school and become a CPA and passed that exam, and my wife is an accountant, so I know how hard that CPA exam is. Yeah. The, Can't pass again. 
The, What's that? The acronym is can't pass again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> but going into real estate where there are certainly commonalities, there are also, you know, it's, it's a pretty big career change to go from a career as a CPA and an accountant into real estate, right? And some would yeah. say that's probably a, a pretty big left-hand turn. So what drew you into real estate? Like you're obviously highly trained and you understand a lot of different asset classes, but nevertheless, real estate was the one that kind of caught your attention. I'm curious why. I don't think it's just one answer, right? It starts when I was growing up. I had a strong attraction to building. So I worked a little bit of construction, worked in Lowe's, worked in Home Depot. Okay. And then I actually even wanted to be an engineer out of college, but then I changed path into accounting. I, I just thought that business was better suited to me. I think it was also at Temple where I was, Temple University saw a great deal of change when I was at school over there. We, there was a huge development boom around campus. And I was just very interested to see what people were doing, interested in what students were paying for this property, that property for rent. At the time I was going there, they were paying four or $500 per room. Now it's like six, $700. And if you're staying on campus, it's even higher, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, As the guy who writes that check, it's <laughs> But hats so, off to the people that actually own those properties. So I had a great deal of desire just learn about real estate. And I actually got ahead of the accounting curriculum while I was at Temple. Uh, which allowed me to free up two classes that I could take anything I want. And I didn't take like the dance class or like the ridiculous class. Basket weaving or right. <laughs> easy, eh? Yeah. I didn't take those classes. I took real estate. I took two real estate classes, which allowed me to get my real estate license. So wow, okay. you talk about career change. So as soon as I got, I was already kind of educated in real estate. As soon as I got out, I took my CPA. After I was done my CPA, I had, or while I was taking it, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get my MBA. After I was done my CPA, I didn't want to look at another textbook again. I didn't take my sales agent test till maybe like around 10 years later, right? It, there was a wow. cutoff that if you didn't take your test within 10 years, you'll lose the credits that you took. Right. You so, have to take the class over. <laughs> eight and a half years later, I took the sales agent test yeah. and, and I passed that. But it wasn't like a drastic career change I made to get into real estate. While I was working, I had this idea to buy a duplex mm -hmm. and live in one side, rent the other side. That never panned out, but I got really into looking at real estate, finding real estate. And I started realizing that there was a bunch of opportunity in Philadelphia. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of how I bought my first property. I bought my first property, I believe like a year, year and a half out of college. Then I bought the second, like two, three years later, and it was a very slow building process. And then in 2016, when I turned 30, I had 30 units. Congrats. That's awesome. <laughs> and then the thought came to mind, I need to make this bigger and better. Right. So that's when I went full-time and that's when I really started focusing on real estate as a full-time career. So, and at that time I had, I mean, you could call it lucky, but I had a real estate sales agent license. I had 30 units. I had a nice flip on the books, ready to go. And then I also had a, the nicest real estate agent transaction there was, which is over a million dollars uh, primed and ready. So I had a very nice start into getting into real estate full time. Nice soft landing. Yes. Yeah. So you burn your boats, you leave the CPA firm and you start full-time with Raza Homes. So that was 16 or was that sooner than, or later than that? It was 2016. So okay. all right. uh, it was 30 years old. Yes. All right. And so your goal by the time you got to 35 was how many? hundred units. How's it going? I'm 36 now. We met and exceeded that goal. I think I was a little bit late, like a few months late to get into that hundred unit mark though. We'll so. give you a special dispensation. <laughs> we'll call it a win no matter what, regardless. <laughs> Oh, we can change the metrics and say before you hit 36, right? Yeah, fair enough. You right? are 35. There you go. Right. <laughs> when the metrics don't work, change the game, right? <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> right. So in the, in the asset classes that you pay attention to. So you mentioned single family homes. You mentioned small multi. In your term, small multi means what? I think the biggest multi unit I have is six units. And okay. then I have two, four units that I bought separately at different times. So I guess combined, they're eight units. But yeah, that's, that's basically what I was comfortable with the last six years or so, where okay. 
I wanted to almost create like a factory like setting, right? Buy a unit, churn it out, get another unit, churn it out. And these smaller multis were in that path, right? It allowed me to do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, you mentioned the Burr method and your business and my business, if we looked at it from 30,000 feet, so I'm in much, you know, I deal with much larger multifamilies. It's the same business. I tell people all the time that, you know, we buy unloved buildings from landlords who probably aren't that great at their jobs. And then we, you know, make them clean and safe and then ultimately make them beautiful where people can be proud to live. Right. Do you raise money for those multifamily units? Uh, Sometimes. Yes. Yes. So that was a slight difference. That's why I didn't get completely in there. I do raise money, but I raise money in terms of a first position mortgage, right? That was my main gig. Right. And now I'm starting to get to the level where I feel confident enough that I can raise money for a bigger project. Whereas my projects, if they required a hundred thousand dollars, I could call one of my former colleagues up and say, look, I'm doing this project. I could use a hundred thousand. Do you want first position mortgage on it? Right. It was a, it was a nice, clean, easy transaction. I guess you would call it. Now the progression is, well, maybe larger multifamilies could work for me because it is kind of the same thing, just as, as you were model. mentioning. Yeah. Buying a 20 family is the exact same process. Exactly. So, and now I have more contacts. I'm building my network and I think the money raised would pretty, pretty much easy at this point. So I don't see that as impossible anymore. Yeah. When I talk to other investors like you, you know, and, and I think we experience this ourselves, that the problem nest isn't necessarily finding money. There's a lot of money out there in search of deals, right? The challenge is actually finding deal flow in properties that make sense. So I live in Connecticut, so I'm a little further up in the Northeast but I'm curious what you're seeing out there in terms of price corrections now with the Fed making the three or four moves that they've made. What are you seeing in terms of price pressure and moving from that seller's market to more of a either equilibrium or a buyer's market? Is that happening in, in your area? So it's kind of difficult to tell for sure what's happening, right? There was periods in the last six months where there was a month or two where we just saw no traction at all. Like we had properties that would sell at the prices that they would sell at and they were not moving. That really had us scratching our heads, right? And I think that the direct marketing world, the wholesaling world, you really have to pivot, pivot fast and make changes to product that buyers are willing to buy, right? Um, what that made us do is get more aggressive on our price negotiations. And then that allowed us to sell to investors at a more discount than previously had. And it, it, in Philadelphia, our market stays generally consistent. So that discount was maybe 5%. And we saw that five, maybe 5-10%. Five, that we saw that 5-10% discount was enough to start moving the properties again. I would say that, yeah, yeah, there was some challenge. There were some challenges in some months. But I think if you're able to pivot your business and correct the pricing yourself, you'll be able to move those properties on a retail level. Like we do do some retail level flips as well. Not that many. I think I have one right now on market. We priced it more aggressively from the start. That's probably going to go under contract based on the views and the saves. But I would also say that the views and the saves are at a far higher number that they've ever been in relation to the offers that we're getting. Right. So the numbers are changing and I think you just got to build a better product price it aggressively, and you'll still have movement, right? People I have to buy houses. Bones. There's still meat on those bones. There's still meat on the bones for me. Margins are slimmer, of course, but sure. people have to buy houses, right? For whatever reason, they have to buy houses. And I mean, there's a lot of people that also buy houses cash too. So interest rate is not always the driving factor. It, it mostly is, but I think that properties will be moved. Like even in the worst years, Housing inventory sales was never at zero. There were still millions of houses right. being sold. So yeah, was, you just and, have to- And that was off. true in 08, 09, when everybody thought the world was ending economically, right? <laughs> exactly. So. People were buying up houses left and right and fixing them up and still selling them. That's when I first got started. I started buying in, in 09, right? So yeah. it was a lot easier at that time. There was- Good times, good times. <laughs> 
we were buying stuff off the MLS. So yeah, and you know the the interesting part about it is you know we're, and we're probably tumbling into some level of recession now, right? Even though the U.S. economy grew a little bit in the third quarter, the interesting thing is 08, 09, 2010, 11, right? Deal flow was easy. Getting the money was a lot harder. Whether that's you know because of the credit market seizing up or people feeling the impact of those credit markets in their own net worth, you know, stock market took a tumble, bond market was crazy. And now it's an inverse, right? Where deal flow is deal flow. And I don't mean that in terms of inventory, because there's, there's still inventory out there, but deals that will pencil out deals that will cash flow. Those are a lot harder to find. And now You've got, uh, I was reading Hunter Thompson's book about raising capital, which is excellent, by the way. And he was saying that there's, you know, in excess of $2 trillion with a T, $2 trillion sitting in the bond market right now. And, you know, if those assets perform as designed, the holders of those bonds are losing money relative to the inflationary market, right? So that's just capital preservation. But the fact is, is that there's a lot of money on the sidelines, just ready to go if you can find a deal. Now, the question is, how do you find that deal? Yeah. And I think that direct marketing has allowed me to find deals and has allowed me to- uh, After my own heart. Yeah. So- Deals are created, not found, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, and there's other things that you might have to do. You might have to think differently than everybody else is thinking. Like in Philly, we do a lot of land ground up development, right? So new construction- you might have to pivot there. What we've chosen to do is pivot geography wise. So we've expanded our geography to allow us to get a larger pool of target area yeah. and increase our volume that way. So there's a whole bunch of things that you could do. Yeah. So tell me more about that. What are the markets that you're currently looking at? We've been Philly, Philly, Philly for the last like 10 years, last six full time. We more recently started to say, well, let's go out in the greater Philadelphia area. So what that also means is a little bit of South Jersey. I live in Central Jersey, so a little bit of Central Jersey. And then everywhere from Lehigh Valley to Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. So that's a big big cut of the world, right? Oh, yeah. So so we're going from our metro to metro pretty much. um, Our surrounding metro. So, uh, and we've found some initial success doing that. And I'll be the first to admit, after you make a decision, it's not the easiest thing to, it's not the quickest thing to have that play out. When we first started saying Wilmington, Delaware, Lehigh Valley, everything in between, I would say it took us three months for us to get our first lead in those areas. And so after our first year, it probably took another two months to get something under contract. And now, I mean, we started having a discussion in the beginning of the year. We've wholesaled a few properties in Lehigh Valley a couple in Wilmington, Delaware, and I just settled on my first property in Lehigh Valley. So it's almost a year later that I'm actually starting to make real moves in in Lehigh Valley. Yeah, but that is something that the folks that are listening should really pay attention to, right? I talk with investors all the time that say, you know, I sent out 4,000 postcards to a particular market and didn't get one lead. Well, my first question is, okay, how big was that market? And secondly, how many times did you touch it? And almost to a person, they'll say, yeah, I sent out you know, one batch and it didn't work, so I don't do it anymore. It takes seven touches minimum to create awareness. And that is between the postcard that they're receiving, Irfan Raza's face, the website, the logo, the value that you bring to the building owner to be able to then create that awareness so that you can start to build rapport in a relationship then build over time some level of trust, right? So you start to stalk Irfan on Facebook and check out his website and see the other deals that he's doing and look at reviews that are online. And you start to realize, okay, Irfan is actually a straight up guy who deals fairly with building owners. Then and only then are people going to start picking up the phone or popping on your website or sending you an email saying, hey, I might want to talk about selling my property as well. That takes time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just setting up a website takes time, right? I have multiple websites. I try to make my professional presence as professional as possible, right? Right. And then it all combines together. I think that if somebody looks you up, they should see 
be comfortable with you. And it's getting them to look you up, which is also difficult, right? You, you mentioned seven touches. We send out the same batch of mailers, same list at least three times. Yeah. If we're sending out mailers, the cold calling list that we do, we hit those lists twice a month at the very least, right? And if we get connection, we're following up consistently. If we get connection with somebody that's open and willing to discuss with us, we're following up consistently. Yep, so absolutely. it is that easy because it's just consistent, dedicated effort. And the opposite side is not that easy because you have to put in that consistent, dedicated right. effort. Consistency and perseverance absolutely 100% matter, right? Yes, absolutely. And follow-up you always hear these statistics about, you know, most salespeople don't follow up and, you know, we're in the marketing business. We're marketing to building owners. We're marketing to investors. Those are our clients and customers and creating awareness within that world, building relationships, becoming friends, right? I mean, people like to do business with people they like, and then ultimately building trust and then putting yourselves in a position where you are in the right to do business and serve those people. It takes a long time. There is no get rich quick. And Absolutely. if you're in this business thinking, oh, I'm going to send out a bunch of mailers and, and make a whole bunch of money, it doesn't work like that. As Irfan, you just said, it is not hard in terms of, it's not complex, let's put it that way, but it is difficult. Yes. Right? And I think that's the best way to say it. That's the yeah. best way to say it, right? Like there's no secret sauce. Everybody asks me, oh, how do you do this? How do you do this? Well, well, what did you do last night? Oh, I watched Netflix. Well, yep. matter of priorities, right? Yeah, that's your first problem right there. Well, yeah. wh why didn't you pick up that book that I told you to read last time I told you to read it? Why didn't you sit there for an hour instead of being on Instagram, sit there for an hour on a dialer and dial for an hour? Yep. And that's not the most comfortable thing to do, right? I mean, that's not in my nature to do something like that, but I have other things in my nature, right? Like I would rather maybe spend an hour to try to find a cold caller to dial for an hour. There's other things that you could do with your time that you're more comfortable with doing, but there is something that you could do to better yourself or better your business. Yeah. It comes down to priorities, right? I, as you were just saying, you're going to binge watch the watcher on Netflix, or are you going to read a book on how to raise capital or how to operate a multifamily more efficiently? Right. Yeah, exactly. Choice. I always find it interesting that, you know, when I meet people who have always dreamed about, being in the real estate business, but haven't quite pulled the trigger yet. I ask them, you know, well, what's stopping you? And they're like, oh, time. Okay. Well, let's see. There are 168 hours in the week. You work 60 of them, right? You go out two hours a night to dinner and hang out with your friends every night. And then you go out Saturday to the tailgate and Sunday to church and doing all the other things you do. And that's another 16 hours. The fact is that, you know, I've done the math. It's 26 hours. Oh, and you have to sleep right? So there's 56 hours. There's still 26 hours in the week. So what are you doing with those? You playing Fortnite, Call of Duty, you know, you binge watching Netflix. What are you doing? And that's time you can use to better yourself and grow your business. And I think one of the things people often get stuck with is mimicking others, right? So you might be mimicking people in a job that just barely get to work on time, clock out at 5 p.m., go home, and then the next morning, they're talking about what they saw on TV, right? right. Uh, Phillies on World Series right now. So I'll give an exception for that. I get it. I get it. The Eagles are great, and the Phillies are about to win a championship, knock on wood. So but, there's yeah. definitely a sports exception right now in Philadelphia. Sure. You can yeah. talk about sports. But generally, that's what most people are talking about, right? They're right. not talking about, oh, uh, I wake up super early. I go to the gym every single day. After I get home from work, I read a book. And then I put in effort to build my business. Nobody talks about that. And I think one of the major things you have to do is you have to start surrounding yourself with people like that. Yes. People that are building themselves. I think the easiest way to do that is probably a gym group, right? Sure. So those people tend to wake up early every morning, go to the gym consistently, and you can surround yourself with a good group of people that are disciplined, right? Yep. And I think the the next step for like younger or less experienced viewers is try to find somebody or some people that are financially savvy, identify what they're doing, what decisions they have made and try to not mimic them, but try to implement those ideas and in model, your life. Model what they did, right? I mean, the, the Tony Robbins says, you know, success leaves breadcrumbs, right? The fact is, is that 
how you did it and how I do it and how somebody else does it, there are clues that are things that we learned along the way that if you just hang out with me, I tell people all the time, you know, give me a call, you buy me a cup of coffee and that 20 minutes that we're together, I'll tell you everything I know, right? <laughs> Happy to do it. And that 20 minutes usually turns into 45 or more because I can talk for days, but you are the sum total of the people you hang out with. Yeah, right? that's, that's so definitely choose. the truth. Another choice. So, yeah, and you can choose your friends, right? It takes a while to get the right people in your group, but it's like everything else, consistent, disciplined effort, trying to find the right people, trying to find the right groups. Here in Philadelphia, we have a pretty large networking circle as well. Like we're very friendly with each other. We sell deals to each other. Yeah. So, I mean, naturally the guys that you like what they're doing, you like how they're spending time with their families on the off days and you want to, you want to get that in your mind, you can reach out to them and say like, look, let's get together for dinner. And just getting around those type of people, I think that's the right answer for the most part. Yeah, man, you can go to meetups. Like, you know, I participate in a really small, there's five of us, a mastermind. We meet every couple of weeks and we talk about here are the deals, you know, here's what's working. Here's what's not working. I need help with. And what I find is that just knowing that call is coming up in two weeks, I am looking to do all the things I need to do so that I can serve that group and help them grow their businesses. And I know they're, you know, the way it works is the reason it works so well is they're doing the same thing. So they're helping me too, right? Rising tide. Well, it's all and I'm, I'm not shy about that at all. I have a business right. coach as well as I uh, participate in the national mastermind. And we meet up three times a year. The guys there are rock stars. I mean, everything's relative. So you can look at me and say, oh, this guy has over a hundred units. He's a rock star. But these guys, I mean, there's 500 units plus owned by multiple people. Right. There's double digit flips done by multiple people a month, like 10 a month that equals 120 yeah, years. These guys multiple are not people. messing around. These guys are not messing. So I was very, very, very lucky to join that group early on. It's allowed me to build my career as well. Just being around these guys that are yeah. just taking to the next level. And look, they're smart guys, but... I look at them and I'm like, oh, this guy's not really that much smarter than me. This guy right. didn't come from a background or money that is any more than where I came from, right? He was relatively guy grew up relatively low income. Right. One of the guys, he lived in a, a neighborhood like 10 minutes away from where I grew up, and he has over 800 units. Wow. So I think allowing yourself to see that allows you to open up your mind and just allows you to believe in yourself too, yeah. right? And that's the key word, right? Is belief. When you hang out with people who are more successful or a little smarter, you know, I always tell people as real estate investors, we're all reading the same book. I may be a few chapters ahead of that guy and Irfan, you're a few chapters ahead of me. We're all learning from each other, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, it's a big world out there. You don't have to compete for deals. There's plenty of deals out there if you know where to look and what to do. But I think the point you're making is a key one in that, you got to surround yourself. And I'm not talking about cutting off the guys you went to high school with. You go to the ball game with them. You go hang out. You have dinner with them. You go have a couple of beers with them after, on a Friday night. We're not saying cut out your friends. What we're saying is make more friends, right? Yeah. And I hang out with them a lot and learn from them. Are you interested in real estate investing right here in Connecticut? Ever wonder where all those real estate investing pros hang out to network? Did you know the Connecticut Real Estate Investors Association will introduce you to those investors and will help you learn how to find deals, fund those deals, and even teach you how to do it without leaving your current job? Go to ctrea.com, that's C-T-R-E-I-A.com, and click on the events button to register for an upcoming event. Hope to see you soon. Buying investment real estate is both thrilling and sometimes stressful. Without a lending expert by your side, most investors don't stand a chance. That's where CTREA Funding comes in. CTREA Funding was founded by investors to help investors just like you fund their deals. Whether you're buying a single family rehab, an apartment building, or really any investment property, our team will understand your deal and help you close quickly. Go to CTREIAFunding.com or call us at 860 876 0572. 
you mentioned a little while ago about books and reading and priorities, right? People like you and me and others that are like us, I always say leaders are readers. As the CEO of your business, I'm sure you consume a lot of information, whether that's books or audio books or podcasts or blogs. You know, I'm curious who you're paying attention to these days and what you're looking at, what you're reading. So I'll tell you what I'm reading, but I just bought a flat top griddle. Uh, it's like a, okay. a Blackstone f- flat top griddle. I have just been consistently watching YouTube videos on what to cook on the griddle. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm trying awesome. to learn a lot from that. So that's what I'm consuming right now, but I know that has nothing to do with real estate. It's still um, interesting. <laughs> so I'll go back to like reading wise. I can't remember the name of the book that I'm reading now. I'm like 10, 15% in right now. But the most impactful book that I've read recently is Who Moved My Cheese? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that a bunch of years ago. So I could not tell you a more impactful book based on like timeline of what we're going through right now. The beginning of this year, in 2022, I refinanced a 30-year fixed loan for 3.75%. Ooh. Now I'm getting quoted for like seven, eight percent. Yeah. Right. So the cheese in the book, the cheese has moved, right? Like the cheese right. has gone okay. elsewhere. And he yep. it, it's a really short book. There's a lot of analogies in that book, but it really clicks, right? It really, really clicks to this time period. So I was actually suggested, like we were talking about friends, be hanging out with the right people. Mm-hmm. One of my good friends. I called him up and I'm like, look, I'm losing a little bit of confidence. I need you to like cheer me up about real. He's in real estate too. And he's a very positive person. He's like, let's go out to lunch. So we went out to lunch. He's like, you got to read this book. I read the book and it was exactly what I needed to read exactly at the right time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. It's a fantastic book about embracing change and how to recognize that the world's changing and being okay with that. Right. Cause the really, the only consistent thing about this world is change. Changes all the time, every day. And people will ask me, like, what are you doing with these interest rate changes? How are you surviving this and that? It might be a little bit brash, but I'll answer like, I'm a business owner, right? Like, all I do is see a problem and try to figure out a solution. I don't always get it right. So I'm not saying that I'm going to come out of this better than ever. I'll make mistakes along the way. But one of the major things that I do is be presented a problem and find a solution. And Interest yeah. rates changing is a, just a different problem, and it's just a different solution I had to find later to that problem. So let's talk about that a little bit. So how are you managing the fact that the Fed has raised interest rates, I believe, four times in the past 12 months? To be honest with you, when that news started happening and interest rates first started rising, I was losing a lot of sleep. I was in the middle of a large refinance, and the lender pulled out and said, we have to increase your rates. So I was scrambling. I had to find another lender. I was scrambling to get things done. And I got that done, but I started also worrying about, well, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? And my mind started wandering to years out when I had to focus on what I can do right now, right? What I can do right now is make sure that I have enough working capital. What that meant for me is that I had inventory lined up for like the next year. Place this guy here, place this guy there, get this permitted. Permits take a long time in Philadelphia. So get this permitted, get the plans drawn up here. I had all this inventory. And my whole mission is building the biggest real estate portfolio I can build. So it goes against my mission to sell. And I had to sell. I had to take this $10,000 gain, this $15,000 gain, I even took a loss on one of the properties, but I was happy to even take that loss because if I had refinanced that property, I would have lost even more working capital. Right. So all that being said, I really made it a mission to alleviate any type of cash strain in the future or in the next six months. I made those changes and I mean, now I'm in a good space. I was happy to have this interview with you. If you had talked to me six months ago and said, oh, can you do a podcast with me? I might have told you no. Like, I, I'm not in the right, right mind space here. Like, everything, man. Yeah, <laughs> to have this interview. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was just, again, consistent effort to get me in the right spot that I needed to be at the time. Right. I think that, you know, going back to your business training, right? And also, I think a high degree of emotional intelligence, right? To recognize, hey, I'm under a little bit of stress here. Okay, let's take a breath. What do I need? What do I need to get through the next 
12 months. What's my business going to look like three years from now, five years from now? Okay. Well, to get there, I need working capital. How much do I need? All right. Well, I spend $2,000 a month plus debt. So let's say $5,000 a month, every month, no matter what, so that I can pay my payroll, pay my bills and make sure my mortgages are serviced. Right? So now, you know, you got, you need $60,000 in cash. And then it comes down to risk tolerance. How much of that 60 grand do you need right now? And how much of it are you confident enough that with your pipeline of deals and projects that you're going to be able to fund the rest of that financial need? That's definitely the simplified version of, of things. I'm not but that smart. You're the CPA here. There's so many moving pieces, right? Your interest rates go up, your DSUR gets lowered, right? Right. And now you are going to do this bird, a true bird, leave no money in the deal. And now you're leaving a hundred. $250,000 into a whole package of refinancing that you were about to do. Right. So there's that there's, you got to look at vacancies on your portfolio. We do a very good job on keeping our portfolio, like 96% occupied. Like we are very good at that. In the winter, we have seasonal, I can't think of another word, but seasonal depression right? Yeah. <laughs> in our portfolio, where if we do have a unit come out, it might take a little bit longer for us to sure. rent that unit. So all these things factor into working capital. What am I going to look like in two months? And also we do very heavy construction. So we're spending over a little over probably a hundred dollars a square foot in construction. Okay. So we do a full gut rehab, reframe, do all new utilities or all new mechanicals yep. and just managing the draw schedule. So pushing out, we're paying out draws to contractors. And we're spending 40,000, making sure that we have draw schedules aligned with that to relieve our capital needs. Yep. So you did a great job of simplifying it, but I would say that it takes a lot of time and effort to identify how weak or how strong you are in that working capital needs. And sometimes you also just don't get it right. Sometimes you can't pull the draw. Sometimes you get stopped by your license inspections mm -hmm. uh, unit. There's a whole degree of things. Sometimes your your units, like say you're trying to refinance a bird deal, sometimes you put a unit out to lease and instead of taking a month, it's taking you three months to find a qualified applicant. There's so many different factors that could change up how your your cash is looking at any other gate, any day. And you really just have to identify and find your risk tolerance. I found that I don't like my balance of money going any lower than a certain threshold of dollar. Me too. So when it goes below that threshold, I start panicking. <laughs> right. Me too. Like, <laughs> what draw can I pull? What can I do? What expense can I hold off on? So that's another way to look at things. Yeah. I mean, I get a little fidgety if we drop below six months reserves, right? And COVID taught me that. It used to be three. But yeah. being an Irishman, I plan for mushroom clouds on the horizon. And then I'm pleasantly surprised when the world doesn't end. And okay, we have enough cash to get through. All right, let's keep going. So I couldn't heard that saying mushroom clouds. I don't, I don't know if I stole it or I made it up. I couldn't tell you, but I say it all the time. So I thought you were going to say potato famine. Oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> That's where I thought you were going with that. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm curious about, you know, your non-real estate life. When you're not chasing deals and wholesaling and burring your way to your financial empire, what else do you like? And, and you're not researching your flat iron grill. What else do you enjoy doing? I'm a, a fisherman now. So I bought a boat during COVID. Right after COVID hit, I didn't really have too much to do. And I, I, water, right? I was basically just presented a boat. And it was at a great deal, great price. I had to say yes. I bought the boat, learned how to, I got my captain's license. I used to fish as a kid from six to like 16. I was pretty into it. And then I got back into that passion. So if you follow me on social media, you will see me on my boat. And I named the boat Real Estate. So R-E-E-L Estate. Clever. <laughs> so, Clever. Uh, so that's what I like to do on my free time. I also have two kids. One is five, one is three, both boys. I spend a good amount of time with them. So at five o'clock PM, I'm stopping what I'm doing and I'm with them. I go pick them up from daycare. I'm with them till when they go to bed, anywhere from eight to 9 PM. And then every weekend is dedicated to them. If I have to work, and there's some, some cases that I have a little bit of overrun. If I have to work, I'm waking up super early. Right. Like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and I'm working from 5 a.m. 
to 8 a.m. So I'm not missing any time with them. So that's like my dedication. And then my fun. Best thing you'll ever do to be a dad, right? I, yeah. I mean, it, it has been so far. So <laughs> it's well, also I have, I have a 19 year old and a soon to be 20 year old and a 15 year old. And I can assure you, so I'm about you know, 10, 15 years ahead of you. It is the best thing you'll ever do. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, I mean, before I had kids with the mastermind that I was talking about, people were saying that too, right? Like surrounding yourself with the right people. You said chapters, you're a few chapters above me in that realm. And you're telling me that it kind of legitimizes that I am making the right decisions absolutely uh, right now. So you only get 18 years with them, right? And that's the best case scenario, right? Best case scenario. And then they go off to their lives. And much as I'd love to say that I'm the most important thing in my daughter, Katie's life, I begrudgingly know I'm not right. And so, you know, she's out living her life and Mag are my little one, same thing. You know, they're, they're living their lives and hanging out with mom and dad is not as cool as it used to be. And honestly, the time flies too. Like sure I does. feel like it was just yesterday that we were having our firstborn. Sure does. And 13 years is all I have left now. So right. I'm basically counting down. I should start doing days or or yeah. hours now. So really make sure I put that focus in there. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's only 13 more fishing seasons, 13 more Super Bowls, 13 more World Series and go fills, by the way. Yeah. And it's a short, a very short period of time relative yeah. and, to the lifespan. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Erfan, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. If someone wants to learn more about your business or how to just shoot the breeze or become one of your friends or join the mastermind that you belong to, what's the best way for them to reach you? Pretty much all my handles are Irfan A. Raza or Irfan.A.Raza. So Facebook, Irfan.A.Raza. My personal Gmail is Irfan.A.Raza at gmail.com. So I-R-F-A-N dot A dot R-A-Z-A at gmail.com. And you can pretty much get me any way you, you wish to get me. I think I'm even on Twitter. Elon Musk just bought Twitter. So that's like the hottest thing ever probably. Yeah, everybody's paying attention to it now, right? You can even get me on Twitter if you want to if you want to get awesome. me on Twitter. Irfan.a.ros. So well, Irfan, thank you so much for your time. I really learned a lot and I'm grateful for your knowledge and I'm sure our audience is as well. So thank you so much and it's really good to see you, man. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a Clark Street Capital presentation. Thanks for joining us. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to like and share it with your friends. Also, leave a comment if there's a topic you want us to cover. We read every comment. If you'd like to learn more about Clark Street Capital and our upcoming projects, please feel free to reach out to us and join our investor club at clarkst.com slash join or join the Underground Insights newsletter at clarkst.com slash newsletter. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.